All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Ward 3 City Council Candidate Forum. My name is Max Sanders, and I will be your moderator this evening. Today's forum is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of St. Paul, Highland District Council, and the Mac Groveland District Council, and is in partnership with Sustain St. Paul, the St. Paul Neighborhood Network, and IATA Leads. The League of Women Voters St. Paul conducts candidate forums to provide the public with an opportunity to hear candidates discuss the issues that are important to members of the public. The League is a nonpartisan organization that does not support or oppose any political party or candidate. The views expressed in each forum are those of the candidates, not those of the League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters Minnesota and our local leagues post complete, unedited recordings of forums. Editing is authorized only for official media reporting. Excerpts or edited clips of candidate forums may not be used for partisan or political purposes. We ask that members of the audience refrain from recording or taking pictures tonight. Again, we will post a full unedited recording of tonight's forum on the, forum on the SPNN YouTube page. We believe the success of our city depends on the values, knowledge, and commitment of our elected officials. Thus, it's essential for the public to better understand the views, opinions, and commitments of people running for elected office. It is this understanding that better equips voters with information to make informed voting decisions. We appreciate the candidates and the audience for taking the time to be with us tonight. Before we begin, I'd like to let you know that you all have, well, you don't have cards. If you have a question you'd like to ask, raise your hand, and then Donna can come by and pick it up from you. As mentioned, today's forum is for the candidates running for office of Ward 3 City Council. I'd like to welcome Isaac Russell, Sarah Jost, Patty Hartman, and Troy Barksdale. The candidates participating in today's forum have all agreed to the forum rules, which were included in their invitation to participate. What are the rules? I'm glad you asked. Each candidate will give a two minute introductory statement. The candidates will have one minute to answer questions and 30 seconds for a rebuttal if necessary. Candidates may only ask for a rebuttal if they're mentioned by another candidate. A timer up front will signal when they have 30 seconds remaining and when their time is up. There we go. We will, uh, we will accept written questions throughout the forum. So if you didn't get a card and want to get a card, just raise your hand. Questions submitted by the audience must be applicable to all candidates, nonpartisan, and must be on topics relevant to the office. Questions that are of a personal nature, embarrassing, hostile, or unclear in intent will not be asked. Similar questions may be consolidated, and questions may be edited for clarity or brevity. Campaign literature, buttons, signs, clothing, or any other campaign-related items are not allowed in the room, but information on candidates is available on the tables outside. Please remain as quiet as possible so that everyone may hear. Please hold your applause until the forum has ended so that candidates will have as much time as possible to answer your questions. Please place your cell phones on silent. Members of the media may be recording this forum for their own use, and the forum is being recorded by the St. Paul Neighborhood Network for viewing by the public. With that, we're gonna start with opening statements. Candidates will each have two minutes for an opening statement. We're gonna start with the candidates furthest to my left. Isaac, you have two minutes. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Awesome, awesome. So it's just honestly fantastic to see so many people here. This is really the essence of democracy, people coming out to hear what you know, folks have to say, but also to hear what's important to you. Isaac Russell, you know, candidate for city council and really, a little bit about myself from St. Paul, um, but for me, uh, in my youth, we experienced uh, a lot of struggles. Grew up mostly my single mother, excuse me, me and my brother and sister, and we experienced periods of homelessness. Food insecurity, housing insecurity, this includes eating at Dorothy Day, living in a homeless shelter. But what really got us on the right path in life, we moved in with my grandparents, and that's when we moved into an environment that had stable, safe, supportive neighborhoods, we had the sort of systems in place that allowed me to get the stability in life and my brother and sister that really was transformative for us. It allowed me to go and get an undergraduate degree in public policy, political science, allowed me to get my master's in public policy, become a Senate staffer for nine years where I worked for the Senate Democrats passing you know, laws that affect folks just like you in this room. Also currently right now I work as the director of public policy at the Center for Economic Inclusion. And really, the reason why I'm running has to do with my background. The basic things that city government does, public safety, parks, libraries, our infrastructure, making sure that our property taxes remain affordable for people to stay in community, 
truly transformational for me. Proud to be endorsed in that vision by carpenters, folks who build the homes that we live in, operating engineers who build the roads and the infrastructure, sheet metal workers who do the exact same thing, firefighters that work to keep us safe. Really, this message of the basics, something that's very important for me because when done right, it can be truly transformative and provide us the communities to make St. Paul thrive. Thank you. Sarah? Good evening. My name is Sarah Jost. I am a mom, engineer, and community leader, and I am proud to be here as your DFL-endorsed candidate running for City Council in Ward 3. I'm running for City Council to build the big dreams that we have for St. Paul together. You know, I grew up in Ward 3, and I've been showing up and trying to help solve problems in my community ever since I was a kid. And it started when I helped organize the Central High School Young Democrats to get Amy Klobuchar elected to her first term as our U.S. Senator. And most recently, when I served on the McAllister Groveland Community Council Board. Serving my community is also a big part of who I am professionally. Because of my great St. Paul Public Schools education, I was able to go on and become a civil engineer where I helped design the infrastructure that we rely upon every day, like our roads and bridges and buildings, and simply being able to have clean water and flush our toilets. And I'm running for city council to bring my professional expertise to be able to make sure that our systems we provide are going to be climate resilient, equitable for all, and built to last. And I'm so proud of the community-driven campaign that we are building, made up of our friends, our neighbors, our leaders in faith, our labor unions, and community organizations. But make no mistake, tens of thousands of dollars of outside money has come into this race to try to influence it. But our campaign is about us and what we can do together. And I am looking forward to continuing to build our community so that we can build a better St. Paul together. And I look forward to discussing that vision with all of you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Patty. Hi, I'm Patty Hartman, and I've been living in the McAllister Groveland neighborhood for more than 40 years. I've been professionally an attorney for more than 40 years. I've raised a family. Uh, through my work, I've learned a lot of skills about investigation and research, problem solving, conflict resolution, the art of compromise, and also the art of civilized warfare, which is really what a lot of civil litigation involves. I'm one of those people that uh, asks a lot of questions, and I tend to be not very satisfied with the first set of answers I get. I like to dig, and I like to find uh, information taking a 360-degree view of a problem before you set on a course and try to solve it. I feel very privileged to be here. I'm here in large part because of the number of people who reached out to me and asked me to please consider doing this. People who have expressed concerns about the direction that the city has been going in, issues having to do with public safety, I'd say, are one of the most recurring and prominent. And I feel very committed to that because if we don't have a safe city and we don't have safety for our families and our neighborhoods, what do we have? It's also concerning to me how many people have indicated that they think about moving or have moved out of St. Paul. I like to think of St. Paul as still St. Small. And um, other, other objectives that are very high on my list are the transparency. I'm looking for more transparency in our government, and I would like to see better, stronger communications uh, and look for more creative ways to get the information out to people so that they can feel fully informed and be engaged earlier in the processes that are made. Thank you. Thank you. Troy? In 2018, I chose McAllister College. I chose McAllister College, I chose St. Paul, I chose Ward 3. As a 17-year-old looking to be involved in the direction of the world, I looked at the cities across the country, I looked at the circumstances in every state, and I said that one of the areas in this country where transformative change will come, one of the areas in the country that will be focused on the next generation will be St. Paul and the Twin Cities area as a whole. St. Paul continues to grow. It has grown over 
the last two decades. And as people continue to have inaffordability in Chicago, in Boston, in New York, in LA, in the traditional nodes of living, they will look for places to move to. And St. Paul absolutely is one of those places. It is an attractive place to live, and that's why I chose it. With this monumental time that is sitting before us, regardless of how long or how short you've been in Ward 3 or have been in St. Paul, we have to recognize that we will be at the forefront of systemic change in the city, in the state, in the country. And enable, to enable that change, this ward and this city needs a capable and confident and great leader. And although I am young, I, Troy Barksdale, will be that leader, and that is why I am here today. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. We're actually going to stick with you for this first question. What are the greatest needs in Ward 3? How would you work to address them and to ensure that those who need help get it? In Ward 3, one of our greatest issues in this place, the whole city, deals with our infrastructure and our roads. People have been complaining about our roads across the whole city in this, wards, this ward in particular. And while we need to find revenue sources and funding for how we are going to pay for road maintenance, one of the things that is prevalent to this ward that is uh, tied to the roads is the densification that people are looking to enact in the city and the ward as a whole. As you densify a ward or a city, you increase the number of permeable surfaces that are in that area. With more permeable surfaces, it is harder to have road maintenance as there's more water, more sleet, more muck that goes into the roads and it's harder to clean up. And so as I look to find funding for the road maintenance and our infrastructural goals that plague the city, I will make sure that the most important needs are put forward. Thank you, Patty. I believe one of our greatest needs is public safety. We need to have a safe place to live and we need to feel and know that we live in a safe place so that our families and the people living here can know that they're safe and enjoy the life that they wanna create for themselves. In order to provide for that, I think we have to fully support our law enforcement, our police departments. I also think that we need to do more to actually prosecute repeat offenders. I think well, I've heard one of the things that goes on now is that there's a lot of um, cases that simply don't get charged. And if there's no consequences, you're gonna have people that have repeat offenses. And that's just a, a practical and predictable result. So I think that's something that we could do is deal with our Ramsey County uh, County Attorney's Office and seek a greater level of prosecution. Uh, I also think that we could do more. <laughs> Isaac? So, I think it's solid, right? No, we're gonna go to Isaac next. But trust me, I have a system. <laughs> I have faith. Um, so our, our, greatest our greatest need, um, I feel, is public safety, because investments in public safety will have a ripple effect, not only throughout Ward 3, but throughout the city. We've heard about the distress that folks are in when it comes to our downtown, but we also know that we have issues in Ward 3 when it comes to catalytic converter theft, car theft, breaking and entering into property. Those are important things that we need to make sure that we fully fund our law enforcement response to take advantage of this situation. I, do believe that is a difference that I have uh, with some of my opponents. But I think it's important also that we focus on these basic city services, our roads, making sure that they're plowed, there's simple investments we can make there. Also, managing our property taxes, making sure that this place stays affordable for people to live and also affordable for people to move into. We need a pragmatic voice focused on these common sense or common concerns. Sarah? <clears throat> Um, I believe that you know our infrastructure matters. Um, it is a big reason why I am running for city council. You know our infrastructure, like things like our roads and buildings are, and bridges, are aging, and they're all things that we we can and we should take for granted. I mean that is the goal that you know as a civil engineer that we have for all of our people. But you could see this year 
that um, you know, our infrastructure is really starting to age and that's when you start to notice the condition of our roads. And I've been talking to folks on the phone and at the doors about our roads since January. And so my number one priority is making sure we take care of our infrastructure. Um, you know, as a civil engineer, I take an oath to uphold the safety and well-being of the public and I plan to do that to make sure that our infrastructure will continue to serve everyone and I look forward to bringing my professional expertise to do that. Sarah, we're gonna stick with you for this next question. Do you support St. Paul's current rent control ordinance, which caps increases at 3% annually or seek an exemption? If not, what would an ideal policy look like? Yeah, you know, I believe that everyone deserves to have safe and stable and affordable housing for everyone from students to seniors. And you know, this rent stabilization policy came about because there were a lot of people in our communities that were being priced out of their neighborhoods and they wanted stability. And it was disproportionately impacting low income folks and our uh, folks of color or people on fixed incomes. And I wanna you know, basically uh, let the policy kind of sit where it's at. We've made a lot of exemptions to it and I wanna understand you know, how it's working, uh, be able to collect some data and if we are gonna move forward with any other changes or exemptions, they should be moving us towards that stability. And I have a background in commercial building construction as well as working in our community, and I look forward to being able to hold space for all of our stakeholders so that we can come up with a policy that's going to work. Thank you. Isaac? So I completely understand the desire of folks to really help uh, our renters, you know? I. I mentioned I was in a homeless shelter, but the important thing for me was I needed a unit to loop, move into. I needed that to be available. And we are getting information back, and it is saying that it is harder to build because of rent control. So I personally think that not only should we maintain the exemptions that we have, but that we should also move to a 30-year exemption that would allow us to add the housing that we're not currently getting. The data that we've seen has shown a significant drop off in the amount of permits that were being requested for multi-unit family housing. When we don't add housing, we don't add options for people to live in. And not only that is we stress property tax owners because it's not as much people paying on that property tax. So really, I, I think we have, to, we have to be honest with ourselves about this, this policy. Rent control is not helping so much of St. Paul. Troy? Yeah, I am a complete opponent to rent stabilization. It is bad macroeconomics and the two-tier system that we have uh, that was the result of the most recent amendment to the ordinance uh, has created a, uh, one tier that it will continue to uh, inflate in terms of the rent prices and another tier that is going to be plagued by um, market, a lack of market mobility um, as people are incentivized to stay in their rental units and as uh, landlords are de-incentivized uh, to invest in capital improvements and maintenance. Uh, I would like to see us inve uh, invest a lot more in capital incentives uh, for these landlords. Um, and I think that everybody should take a look at national uh, rent stabilization ordinances as this is the most strict and most hated in the country. Patty? I don't support the current rent control uh, ordinance ha as it was initially put forth or how it's been really eviscerated by so many of the exceptions. In general, rent control just doesn't work. There's a lot of information and data that shows that. It has the unfortunate and ironic outcome of driving up the prices of rent because it drives down the availability of rental units. And if you think about it, people who own the buildings, and I know people that have owned buildings and they're usually small landlords and they're not really looking to get rich off of that building or to gouge. But if you start to try to control what they can generate for revenue, you're infringing on their own property rights. So I, I don't think it works and I think the solution is really more systems where you can help people pay the rent where they need to be or, or provide the housing but not try to control what landlords are going to charge and certainly not to make uh, distinctions and discriminations between how old the buildings are. Uh. Patty, we're going to stick with you for this next question. See? <laughs> Told you. Patty, what is your position regarding pilots, payments in lieu of taxes for nonprofit entities in St. Paul? 
Well, I would say there's no harm in asking, you know. <laughs> Um, and that's what the pilot is, a payment in lieu of taxes that you ask for from a nonprofit entity that doesn't otherwise have to pay it. I know there are a lot of organizations uh, that are happy to pay something towards the services that they get, and certainly we should allow that to happen um, because we could use the revenue. But, um, you know, other than asking, it's not something that you can necessarily enforce. If they're tax exempt, they're tax exempt. Uh, so I would say yes, be open, and uh, I'd be you know happy to solicit that and talk to some of the colleges, universities, or other nonprofits that perhaps have some funds that they would wi be willing to commit to that. Troy, certainly, um, I'm going to mostly agree with Patty on this one. Um, with nonprofits, there is uh, just a p tricky paradigm with their um, uh, inability to be taxed. And as it relates to colleges, um, while on the surface they uh, might seem to have a lot of money nominally, um, there are a lot of cracks in these private institutions um, where they are lacking in certain expenses uh, on campus. How do I know this? Uh, I am currently on a campus. Um, and so um, while asking, like Patty said, I think it is uh, a perfectly fine idea um, I also am in agreement that there isn't a whole lot we can do beyond that. Sarah? Yeah, um, I support revisiting payment in lieu of taxes. This was something that we have um, previously visited as a city. You know, we have a revenue challenge here in St. Paul. Uh, a little over 20% of our land is exempt from property taxes, and that is a huge challenge for us as we've talked about some of the burdens of property taxes. And so, yes, I am very interested in exploring payment in lieu of taxes. Um, a couple of concerns I have are, you know, we're not able to necessarily enforce them. Um, I've talked to, you know, a few students at universities that are concerned they might just get passed down through their tuition. So I want to make sure we're finding a way to make that work. But, you know, as a city, I think we can use all the help we can get to get some extra revenue. And even if we just get a little bit, that that will really help us out. Isaac? So I am probably going to upset my current employer because I work for a nonprofit, <laughs> but I'm going to tell them the truth is, is, you know, we, we consume city resources. And so it would be more than equitable that we pay a share of that. You know, the recent court decision changed the way that we assess, you know, folks just across the enterprise. So in terms of, of revenue that the, the colleges you know, institutions like that would have. We have some colleges with some amazing endowments, uh, including, you know, St. Thomas and McAllister. So absolutely, I absolutely think this is something we should be doing. This is some of the pragmatic tax base expanding things that we should be doing. Um, true, there's some limitations, obviously, because of the IRS code, but there's also some things that you can do that it might be some very public nudges uh, to, to help bring folks' uh, contributions into the city. Isaac, we're gonna stick with you for this next question. A nicotine-free generation ordinance would prohibit vendors in St. Paul from ever selling tobacco products, vapes, cigars, and cigarettes to people born after January 1st, 2004. Community organizations, the city council, and the mayor's office are currently exploring this ordinance. St. Paul would be the first major city in the United States to pursue such an ordinance. As a city council member, would you support a nicotine-free generation ordinance? So, to pardon my ignorance, this is the first that I've heard of this, right? but knee-jerk reaction. See, of all the issues I studied for, but, um, you know, honestly, just the initial assessment of this is we, you know, we know exactly the, the detrimental effects of smoking, secondhand smoke. These are, these are well known. They've been known for generations. However, initially just, just hearing this, right, this does get at things such as, as people's right uh, at an adult age to, to decide the sort of products that they want to purchase, right? We allow this for things such as alcohol, and it's very difficult to me to see as someone who is an adult, when they turn 18, uh, we allow you to enter a contractual agreement for a whole host of things, but then we would tell you that you can't purchase uh, a, a cigarette. So that's just some of my concerns with my first encounter of this. Sarah? Um, yeah, I think that, you know, in our city that our public health and the health of you know our residents and thinking about the future of our children is really important um, I would you know want to dig into this a little bit further you know to understand some of the 
uh, some of the impacts that it could have on our communities. Um, I have some concerns about, you know, just again, people's, you know, people being free to be able to, you know, buy legal substances that they should be able to. Um, I, I know that maybe there are other things we can do at the city to continue to prevent it from getting in the hands of, of children or that type, that type of thing. Uh, I would want to, you know, confer with the Ramsey County Public Health that the city works with to understand, like, you know, what are their thoughts and is this something that we need? Is there another way to do it? Um, but very interesting. <laughs> Troy? So as soon as you ban something, it becomes really hard to regulate that. If people want to have nicotine, they are going to get their hands on it. That's one aspect. The other aspect of this is I know, I know, I know this will disproportionately affect low income and minority people. There is so many times where I see an unhoused person sitting on the curb and one of the only, what I would call the lights of their world is that they have a cigarette to enjoy right, as people are passing them by. And so I, I'm really wary of things like this because I would prefer to have uh, staunch regulation where we're very uh, precise in who is getting their hands on nicotine opposed to banning it, in which case we aren't going to know who gets uh, their hands on it. Patty? Um. Assuming I understand the question, I, I don't see there being much point to that. I think it glamorizes the purchase. I think younger people will uh, reflexively think that it could be cool to be able to procure that. And so you ban it, the purchase of it in St. Paul. Somebody's just going to go somewhere else to buy it. Uh, anything that seems forbidden can seem all the much more tempting to certain ages. I, I, and we have so many other substances that I think could represent greater um, detriment to people's health. Certainly it's nice to avoid smoking. I think we've already got a lot of bans on where people can smoke, that we can keep clean air going. So I generally wouldn't favor that. Patty, we're going to stick with you for this next question. What improvements would you propose for Sibley Plaza? <laughs> oh, Sibley Plaza. Well, um, there, I'm assuming you're probably suggesting that there could be something there to clean up some of the blight and possibly some of the, the crime in the area. Um, finding some businesses that might want to move in there would probably require that. Uh, it's, it's an area that, well, you've got an Aldi store that enjoys a lot of traffic. You've got a few other stores that are adjacent to it, the foot, foot traffic. It's certainly an area where you could have um, a better business presence. I would think public safety would be a, a significant improvement there if they could uh, get a handle on that. Um, that would be it, public safety. Troy? So I'm gonna be very clear and say I'm pretty naive to what the situation here is. Um, but based off of the context that Patty is talking about, I'm going to make a guess and say that it has to deal with uh, either homeless encampments or loitering or some form of the two. Um, and in either case, whether I understand this question correctly or not, um, when dealing with a public security issue, I want to make sure that we are uh, multifaceted. I don't want to just clear people up uh, and out of a certain area. Uh, why? Because they're going to go to another area. Uh, I want to make sure that people are taken care of uh, and are otherwise getting the help that they need. Um, and so as I continue to inform myself on this situation, uh, that's the approach that I'm going to take. Isaac? So, you know, I actually live down the street, uh, Lexington and West 7, so I, I frequently am, am at uh, the area on Sibley Plaza. My father actually walks here regularly. He's a Section 8 renter in Davern Park Apartments, and that's his exercise because he's familiar with it. And we've seen a lot of turnover in terms of business. So one of the most important things you need to do is look at business stability there. So this is something that has come up in some of the discussions when I was on the Highland District Council of making sure that we're working to let people know the businesses that are there and trying to drive foot traffic down there. I think also we can partner that with making sure that we have a law enforcement response that's there so that people 
who are in the neighborhood, which are a lot of people of color, make sure that they feel safe going to these establishments and make sure that they see themselves as reflected in those establishments. So that's what I really think we should do. And I also think that the city would be able to hopefully try to be the cheerleader and drive new businesses into the empty storefronts that we see down there. Sarah? Um, I think, you know, Sibley Plaza is a great opportunity in our ward. Um, unfortunately, the West 7th area has been left out of our ward for a very long time. I see a lot of opportunity there. Um, there's an Aldi there, there's a Planet Fitness, um, there's a brewery there that's really great. Um, what I would like to see happening is absolutely more businesses opening, and especially that will really serve the folks in that community. You know, we have a grocery store. Um, there's folks in that community that don't have access to a community center, for example. Um, there are folks in that area that could probably use access to healthcare. I think there's a chiropractor um, at Sibley Plaza. Uh, but being able to build things in that area that will serve the folks uh, many people that don't have access to cars and would be able to just walk over there and also being able to drive more people to Sibley Plaza. So I think there's there's just some really great opportunities there and I'm really excited to explore them. Sarah, we're gonna stick with you for this next question. What specific projects in Ward 3 will you support to increase access to high quality transit? Yeah, so, <clears throat> You know, I think transportation is uh, really important all over our city. We need to be able to provide diverse options so that everyone can, you know, have an option to be able to get around the city, no matter if you're walking or biking, um, taking the bus or, you know, driving a car. And I actually used to take the bus from Ward 3 every day to downtown Minneapolis. So I'd really like to see some of those, you know, rapid bus routes um, uh, being put in place again. Uh, I think we also are you know, exploring some permanent transportation along West 7th. I just mentioned there are a lot of folks along West 7th that don't have access to transportation. And then there's also the CP rail spur. And I have heard neighbors whose doors I've knocked talking about wanting to have you know, some type of bike trail or pedestrian access that they can also utilize. So I think there are a lot of things that we can do in Ward 3 and I'm really excited to bring my engineering expertise to help provide better transportation planning in our district. Isaac? So uh, West 7th is a very interesting corridor. As you get further up towards the Excel Center, there's a little bit different needs, ease of access to getting to businesses. Whereas further south towards where I'm at uh, in Ward 3 is that there's a lot of folks who need access to, to work. A lot of folks who actually work um, at the airport. So I think the, the most feasible game in town on this area, in this area is bus rapid transit in a dedicated lane. I do think that that would be uh, very helpful for a lot of folks and the best compromise I think we can find in that corridor. For the CP Railway Spur, I think having bike ped uh, would be very helpful. It's a way to connect folks all along the corridor that runs all the way up to uh, the downtown. So that's something that I would be personally interested in doing. And there is room that has been left um, as part of the Highland Bridge site development uh, for possible implementation. So I think that those are just a couple of things. But then, obviously, we're going to have to work with Metro Transit to make sure that our bus needs are being met. Patty? I think it would help if they do study the routes and see where the needs are. I know that Metro Transit tries to keep track of the usage of these different routes. And uh, it's, it's easier for them to uh, reconfigure the bus routes than it is working with uh, the trains. I know there are a lot of people that are not interested in taking the trains because they regard that, again, as another safety issue. There are too many behaviors that go on on the trains that I think people, the public find threatening. And whenever I see the trains go by, you can almost count how many people are in there. But I think if Metro Transit would keep track of the routes that people actually use and reconfigure the buses there, uh, they would see an increased ridership and maybe not have people have to transfer so much. And maybe there's something they could do to install some people from a safety standpoint on the routes where there have been so many issues with uh, behaviors. Troy? Um. So for this campaign, I had to fill out a questionnaire from a group called Move Minnesota, and they spoke to a couple of solutions, specifically with busing. Um, one of them that I am very favorable to is signal priority um, for buses. I think that's a very easy uh, solution or addition that we can implement. Um, the next is uh, that they were talking about was ded were dedicated uh, bus lanes. And um, my position on those are, in certain pinch points, they would be a good idea. Um, but I would 
look to extend access to the, for those to all large vehicles um, so that we're not uh, in a situation where smaller vehicles are compromised. And then in terms of a nebulous proposal that I want to explore more, um, vans, vans, vans. I want to be able to uh, enable people to carpool to specific work points um, so that they can get to work more easily. Troy, we're going to stick with you for this next question. Do you support the SPARC initiative, which would have St. Paul property taxes pay for childcare and early childhood education in the city of St. Paul? Yeah, I believe that this is a worthwhile thing to spend on. Um, this is one of these situations where, yes, we have to uh, increase uh, our tax levy to be able to um, raise the funds uh, for these subsidies. Um, it is absolutely critical because we're talking about public safety and we're talking about uh, city sustainability to make sure that our uh, children, for our uh, young people in our community to be well taken care of. Um, and enabling parents to do that uh, is certainly a worthwhile expense. Um, with uh, behaviors that Patty's talking about, um, if you want to eliminate those, you're not going to eliminate those by increasing the number of police. You're going to eliminate those by getting to the root of people's development and making sure that they're well taken care of at a young age. Patty? I don't support the uh, SPARK initiative. I don't think that uh, it's fair to burden the taxpayers with um, more costs for some program like that. I don't think the city should get involved directly with child care services. I know that we have a number of other programs that will step up to the plate and help families if they need assistance from some aspect with their family, with their children, and I would like to say we should make better use of those. But I, I don't think we should spread our resources that thin and get into the child care business, and I really don't think it's fair to burden all of our people for an expense like that. Sarah? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned I'm a mom. I recently uh, went through how much it costs to send a child through childcare. We spent $50,000 to get our son ready for pre-K. Um, so I think that we need to find a way to provide affordable childcare to be able to make sure our littlest learners can learn and in order to make sure that our parents um, and caregivers uh, can you know, be able to go to work and still make ends meet. I think that you know I was really proud to see the work that we did at the state legislature, and we have a lot of groups like St. Paul Public Schools and our local community organizations that are invested in this. And I am looking forward to you know further study on this to see if it is feasible to have the city pay for this or to be able to utilize some of our under other funding opportunities and organizations to be able to help us out. But it is something that we really need to find a solution to now. Isaac. So I mean. Childcare is incredibly important. I, we go to the oldest childcare in the world as grandma and grandpa, but now the kids are 10, 12, and 14, so the 14-year-old is now the childcare uh, uh, person. So, um, you know, the state has made some significant investments in our CCAP child care assistance program, but then also our sliding scale, which is designed specifically to get these resources to people in need. Is it enough? I don't think anyone says that it is. But I'm very skeptical, and I do not think that the city should be setting up a parallel infrastructure that it is A, never done before, but then B, index, like putting it on property taxes when we're already having issues paying for a basic infrastructure and paying for the basic things that we really want and really expect out of, out of those taxes. So I don't think that this is best to be housed at the city. I think we should be working to connect people with resources at the county to make sure that they have what they need um, uh, to take care of their children. Isaac, we're going to stick with you. What can St. Paul City Council do to keep residential property affordable for local buyers? So to keep residential property affordable for, for local buyers, the first thing is build more, right? That is one of the foundational challenges that we have. We are not building enough homes. And we're seeing in the cities that are able to increase their housing stock, um, which, you know, for instance, Minneapolis, it's a much different story. So finding new ways to increase housing stock, part of that is gonna be encouraging investment to come back here. Part of it is also gonna be looking at ways to deal with increasing 
density in a responsible, smart way that has right-sized housing in the neighborhood, right? That doesn't allow a free-for-all in terms of what homes that you would put there, but does provide options for people to maybe subdivide certain units if it fits to provide different housing options, both for seniors to aging community and for families that need a rental place or for families that are looking for a lower cost, first time home in community. Sarah? Yeah, I think that we all you know, deserve to have safe and affordable housing options. And there's a couple of things we can do to make housing more affordable. Um, we can you know, provide more housing through um, building, building more density, and that also will help increase our property tax base, which will increase money back to the city. Um, a big way and a big thing that will really help is getting more local government aid to build more affordable housing. Uh, I've been intentionally working with our uh, you know, local St. Paul delegation and have um, earned the support of many of our local elected officials in order to be able to do that. Um, we can also work on having more you know, community-owned uh, housing through things like community land trusts and cooperatives to be able to help provide opportunities for people um, to own homes. And I really look forward to bringing some of my background in commercial building design to be able to help provide more affordable options for people in our city, um, from everyone from you know, our young people looking for their first home to seniors who want to stay in our community. Troy? So, I want to rehabilitate vacancies to uh, increase access to owner occupancy here in St. Paul. Um, building more houses uh, would be nice, but as we look to increase density, that would probably uh, entail shrinking lot sizes, uh, which is an issue when you're looking for parking and when you're considering permeable services, which, uh, as I've spoken about before, may lead to uh, extra strain on our sewage system, which I promise you nobody wants. Um, and so where I truly believe I have an edge with everybody else here on this forum is that I have a concrete plan to sell uh, general obligation bonds uh, for the rehabilitation of some vacancies uh, to be able to uh, take pressure off of the rental market and also serve as, uh, as well as the owner-occupied market and serve as a nice base uh, for people who are currently renters to enter the owner-occupied market. Patty? I think we could look back at the uh, older housing stock that tends to be more affordable. Maybe there are some problems with it. Some of it could be uh, renewed, renovated. That's always a good source rather than always trying to build something new where you have much higher construction costs. I know that there have been, I have neighbors that I believe first purchased their house in my neighborhood through some program. I don't know what happened to it, but it was there for first time home buyers, things that helped them get the down payment. I've known other people that were able to qualify for a program, but these were programs from somewhere else uh, where there might be a buy down on an interest rate helping somebody lower the interest rate of what might be prevailing mortgage loans. But in general, yes, anything we can do to help people get them into a home so that they can get a foothold as a homeowner, I think would be a good thing. And that would be looking for less expensive ways to provide those homes as well as some financial assistance getting into them. Sarah, we're gonna go to you first for this next question. How do you propose to balance the loss of mature trees with proposals for separated off-street bike paths? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so, you know, I, I'm assuming that this is probably referring to the Summit Avenue Regional Trail. And, you know, we need to build um, and provide, you know, multiple types of transit for everyone in our city, no matter how you want to get around. And the number one thing with Summit Avenue um, and really any street we're looking at, is a lot of our roads are past their design life and their road infrastructure as well as the utilities underneath that need to be replaced. And we need to be looking ahead to utilize the funding we have to build climate resilient infrastructure and making sure that no matter how you wanna get around, that you have a safe and efficient way to be able to do so. And I think that working with the Department of Forestry can really help us make sure we can provide that balance and again, that's why I really bring my engineering expertise in planning and being able to balance many things at once. And I know that we can come up with a solution that will be built to last and work for everyone. Thank you. Patty? Well, I'm hoping we don't have the loss of too many mature trees. And I think we really have more to do to revisit and repeal this plan for Summit Avenue. I think it's a glaring example of a failure 
of the city government that it's gotten as far as it has with as little transparency about what was supposed to be happening there. I think it would be uh, a tremendous loss to us on an environmental and an architectural and a historic level if we end up putting through the bike plan that they're talking about. Uh, and obviously we need to preserve our leafy green, uh, green spaces and those trees that are irreplaceable. They're very old, they're very mature. So I hope we can stop that plan. Troy? Yeah. Um, with the rehabilitation of roads, the reality is that we're either going to rip up some trees or a lot of trees. Um, that's at least what I've uh, analyzed when it relates to the Summit Ave plan. Um, I, I personally am in a similar camp to Patty. I really appreciate the greenery on Summit Avenue, and I uh, think it is what makes part of St. Paul and Ward 3 really beautiful. Um, I, I, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's a matter of if we can replace those trees sustainably, um, we'll be in good shape, but that seems like a tall task um, and likely an expensive one. Um, and so I, this is one of these positions uh, on Summit Ave that I'm, I'm kind of stuck on. And at the end of the day, I'm just looking to maintain all roads. Isaac? So this is one of the important situations in which there's competing interests, right? We can bring together a group of people that say absolutely no. We can bring together a group of people that say absolutely yes. But to me, this is where a council member can be forward leaning and try to be that diplomat that brings different stakeholders to the table and basically say, what is it that we're looking for out of this? Right? I think everyone would be concerned about the loss of mature trees. That's why I do believe the city should commit to just the net gain of trees throughout the entire corridor. Right? I do think folks generally support biking, and I think we need to make sure we're having safe biking. But one of the profound concerns that I've had about this overall project is the fact that a lot of people have not felt that their concerns have been reflected in the development of the plans. And when that happens, you engender a lot of distrust, and that can unfortunately help poison the well and lead people not to trust the process. And the process is just as important as the outcome. So to me, I do support do support biking, but I absolutely support making sure that people's thoughts are reflected. Troy, we're gonna go to you first for this next question. St. Paul has a need for additional funding for our roads, bridges, and parks. Given this, would you change the mayor's proposed 2024 budget? If so, what choices would you propose? Um, yeah, I think the budget needs a whole lot of reallocations to it. Um, one of the places that I want to reallocate from uh, is, frankly, uh, the, the police. Um, and I don't want to frame this as a defunding the police stance. What I want to say is we need to analyze where our most expensive uh, expenditures are in our budget, and policing is certainly one of them. And when I look at it, I see that there is uh, that we are spending tens of millions on police patrolling. Police patrolling isn't something that prevents crime, it's something that responds to crime. And so when I'm looking at the mayor's budget, um, not just for the fiscal year of 2024, but the, during the entirety of his administration, uh, there are a whole bunch of shortfalls that lead us to not having a sustainable budget, which is why we're in the hole for infrastructure in the first place. Patty? What I can't help but notice, how, how often we end up digging up the same street over and over. <laughs> and uh, I mean, downtown St. Paul, you can barely move around and uh, get in and out of some of those buildings, but it's also true in a lot of these neighborhoods. And it seems to me that there's been very poor planning, that they don't look ahead far enough to see all of the different things they want to change and make it more efficient when they do finally dig up the street. The other thing that I've seen information on, I'd have to investigate it, is that there are ways of digging up streets that can be really more focused, where you don't have to dig up the whole street, and that you can just go in and can be very focused on what you're doing to improve those surfaces. So I think there, there might be worth investigating the technology that does exist and looking at some of the other methods that may be less invasive, but also we could use some better planning here 
in terms of where we're going to put our resources and how often we re re redo all of these intersections. Isaac? So in terms of the budget, um, I do think it's important that we you know, recognize the fact that we have a massive backlog of deferred maintenance on so many roads. And that is beyond the capacity of the city budget to do, right? 340 some odd million is coming from property taxes. And a lot of it comes from fees and then local government transfers, local government aid. So it's important to establish dedicated resources for our roads, but then also for our parks where a lot of folks are having challenges. But for me is that I do think that we should be making sure that we are substantively prioritizing things such as public safety because of the ripple effect that we have throughout the entire city, right? Investments in public safety is an investment in economic development. It's an investment in how we can interact with our schools and partnerships so that there's safe learning environments. So for me, I was actually very happy to see the increase uh, in, 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 in public safety and do not think that we should be redistributing or reallocating the budget away from there because we've seen the results of that. Sara? Yeah, so when it comes to our roads, the reality is that our, with the current state of our roads and their condition, um, our city budget is not enough money to be able to replace all of those roads. It's about $800 million, about $200 million of those dollars go to public works. Um, you know, I uh, mentioned that I work as a civil engineer. I've personally been responsible for over half a billion dollars in construction projects across our country. And I am really looking forward to making sure we can get more funding, um, whether it's through the 1% sales tax or through local government aid, because I understand the magnitude of the money that we need and you know, how we can make our best use of it. And I look forward to being able to use that expertise to get the most out of our money. Um, what Patty was referring to is um, a trench box versus an open excavation for road reconstruction. There are you know, cost balances to that, but it can certainly um, provide you know, a better construction option in some situations. And that's the expertise I look forward to bringing to replace the hundreds of miles of roads in our city that desperately need to be replaced. Let's talk about that sales tax referendum. Sorry, we're gonna stick with you. Are you in favor or against the 1% sales tax referendum on the ballot? Um, so I will sort of repeat what I just said. Um, I uh, you know, really strongly believe that our infrastructure matters. Um, I, you know, as a civil engineer, I have seen um, all of our basic infrastructure like our roads and bridges and parks and water and wastewater really um, really get into a state that you know we we can no longer take for granted all across our country and it's really frustrating for me as an engineer because we work so hard to design these things and work with our construction workers to make sure that they're going to last um, we know that we need to take immediate action on our roads in st paul um, i think that it's an opportunity to ask everyone who comes to our city to be able to pay their fair share and I you know, will be supporting it. And again, I look forward to bringing my engineering expertise to help us you know, spend what will be almost a billion dollars towards our roads and our parks and our city to make sure it will serve everyone. Thank you. Is that a yes or no? It's a yes. Do you support the 1%? Yes. Isaac? So I am going to vote yes on the 1%, but I do think that we have to acknowledge what exactly this does to business. We will be having the highest sales tax in the surrounding jurisdictions, which will hurt some consumers and it absolutely will hurt some businesses. I also understand that there is a perception amongst folks in the, in the business industry that, that St. Paul is, is not business friendly. And it's really all hands on deck to make sure that we're developing the economy that we need. But part of that development of the economy is focusing on these basic things such as our infrastructure. It costs somewhere between 22 to $25 million per year for the basic street maintenance that we need. And we recently lost a court case and had to increase uh, property taxes to make up for that. But the massive backlog is gonna require dedicated revenue way beyond this. So I'm not happy about having to increase this, but I do believe that we should be funding our basic infrastructure from now into the future. Troy? Uh, kind of on the opposite side of the coin from Isaac, I'm gonna give like a lukewarm no. Um, was, I, I recognize that we need a dedicated way to pay for um, our infrastructural needs for parks and our streets. Um, but I also recognize that a uh, tax like this is gonna hurt those who uh, have the least amount of means. Um, as a college student, I walk around with not a whole lot of cash. 
in my pocket. Um, and so the you know extra couple pennies or a couple bucks that accumulate with uh, a sales tax actually really matter to me. And uh, for people who are certainly far less privileged and are living uh, with far less security, it matters uh, incredible lot amount, uh, incredible amount more to them. Um, I would say that if this is passed, um, the city council has to rush to make sure that proper legislation is in place so that the sales tax money doesn't get used for just about anything. Patty? I'm an emphatic no, not a lukewarm no. Uh, I don't see a reason to have this tax. It is going to be a burden on everybody because if you live in St. Paul and you order online, you're going to get taxed because that's where you live in the highest taxed city in Minnesota. And you're not gonna have any say about that. It isn't simple enough to just say I can buy things elsewhere. It's also a burden on the businesses, but a burden on all the residents, a burden on the businesses. It makes it less business friendly. Uh, and uh, yes, it is a regressive tax. It's gonna hurt the less financially capable people the most. That where, will be where it inflicts its greatest damage people who have less money. If we could support our businesses and our enterprises, we'd probably see greater levels of commerce and you'd probably generate more sales tax at the rate we already have. Make it business friendly. We're gonna stick with you, Patty. We're gonna talk about garbage. <laughs> St. Paul's current contract for garbage collection expires in October. What, if any, program improvements would you suggest? Well, that's what got me started on community involvement. And uh, so I've been watching this, and I remember when it went through, well, it was going to get tweaked. It was going to get improved. Everything was going to get better. And gee, here we are. We're bumping up on the deadline, and they need another 18 months to figure it out after they engaged a, a com community committee of people for 18 months who met and gave a lot of good thought. But anyway, that's our city. And I know that a couple of uh, the, the out the objects here that would improve it for a lot of people is allow people to opt out. It gives you a, a fail safe. If it's really that unreasonable, you can self haul, share with your neighbor. I think it would improve the congestion that's in the alleys. I would like to see them um, make it really much more local and let uh, various neighborhoods maybe take the district councils control it. Let there be different, um, different contractual arrangements by neighborhood because different lifestyles might support different needs. Troy? Does city involvement uh, make the garbage get picked up more easily? Um, that's something that I've been wondering about this question is uh, whether or not the effectiveness of garbage disposal increases with city involvement. Um, aiding private haulers to make sure that they're doing the best job possible um, is my prerogative. Um, when this question came up uh, and uh, a private hauler representative got to speak to the media, uh, they talked about the inability to access um, garbage due to poor road maintenance um, and just an inability to have access. Uh, we can't give them that excuse. Making sure that road maintenance, making sure that alleyways are well maintained uh, will help our private haulers, and if we need to give them subsidies, uh, maybe that is necessary. Sarah? Yeah, so um, we were talking about organized trash when I first joined the McAllister Groveland Community Council in 2019. And, you know, I am very interested in the changes that we might be able to make um, with, this, with this next cycle. I, I am interested in, you know, people being able to combine their, uh, their bins together. I think that that would be more efficient. I'll mostly be looking for ways to make trash collection more efficient. Because, um, again, I'll throw in some fun engineering facts. A garbage truck puts 9,000 times the point load onto our roads as an SUV. And also, you know, more greenhouse gas emissions are emitted. So we need to find ways to be able to optimize this process um, that we currently have with our private haulers in order to make sure that um, you know, we can meet those concerns. Isaac? So, I mean, exciting topic, trash. Um, but no, it, it's important, right? Because these are the basic things people rely on from city government to provide. 
So one of the things that I think that we can do is, is trying to make sure that people get a good price on what it is that they would have, right? So what's the way that we can put some competitive, competitiveness into this, this marketplace to, to really help the consumer? So one of the things that I think would be an interesting idea to perhaps explore is a limited pilot project that would be a municipal option. A lot of people don't realize this, but Minneapolis is not completely private. It is not completely municipal. So I do think trying to increase competitiveness that benefits the folks in this room is one thing. I do also think we should explore looking at making sure that our multi-unit housing places can share those bins, right? So it just doesn't get cluttered and it's just not filled um, with really just bins. So I do think that that sort of flexibility uh, would really be incredibly helpful. Um, and I do like the fact that the city has taken over some of the calls because I am concerned by the fact that we are hearing reports of people not getting their trash picked up. Isaac, we're gonna stick with you for the next question. What are your environmental policy priorities? So, environmental policy priorities, and we have to take a, a multifaceted look at this. One, there is the acknowledgement that the city has limited funds. We really don't have the money to make the substantial investments necessary. So it's connecting people with things such as the Inflation Reduction Act and the Carbon Free by 2040, both connecting residents with the options for appliances, weatherization, solar, but then also looking at the ways that the city can implement some of these processes themselves so that we can look for more efficient ways to heat public buildings. I do think also encouraging multimodal transit. Right? Regardless of how folks feel about bike plans and, and everything else, is that I do think that people realize that we need different modes of transit. Incentivizing carbon-free carbon -free modes of transit would be an incredibly important thing to do. So really, those are some of the essential things. I would also look at making sure we're expanding the tree canopy just across the city, but specifically in neighborhoods that are struggling with that. And Ward 3 does have areas in which the tree canopy is not adequate for folks. Sara? Yeah, so addressing the existential threat of climate change is my number one environmental policy. Um, I, again, with my civil engineering background, I bring a professional expertise to this. We know that our buildings and transportation systems make up over 70% of our greenhouse gas emissions. So we need to provide more sustainable tra transportation and housing infrastructure. Um, we also need to make sure we are taking a look at environmental justice. We have folks in our city that are disproportionately impacted by our environment, by the temperature, by our tree canopy. Um, and you know, simply, again, being able to have clean water. Um, so I'm really looking forward to bringing my professional expertise to this very immediate issue we're facing, and I'm proud to be the only candidate that's endorsed by climate action groups such as Sunrise Movement Twin Cities, the DFL Environmental Caucus, and Move Minnesota Action. Troy? So I've talked about sewage uh, quite a few times up on this podium, and uh, I'm gonna double down on that. Uh, flooding is our number one environmental hazard here in the city. Uh, it affects us at all times during the year. Um, and uh, not only can we not uh, afford for our sewage system to be strained, but we can't allow for uh, runoff to continue to pour into our river. Um, on the other side of things, I think that uh, traffic congestion conge Traffic congestion uh, is something that we certainly can address and minimize uh, traffic pollution uh, by endorsing uh, signal priority for bus, dedicated bus and lanes um, and making sure that our public transit and our larger vehicles are getting where they need to go uh, and not idling in our roads. Patty? I think we need to protect and preserve our green spaces, particularly our mature trees, our, our grasses, our parks, our recreation centers, that should be a very high priority. We should be looking at ways to undo the Summit Avenue bike trail to make sure that we don't destroy anything there. I think there are things that we can still do about making it, buildings more energy efficient. I know there's been a move in downtown St. Paul. A lot of the building owners, I think, have been incentivized to do things to upgrade what's going on in those buildings. And we've always had those programs available for homes that you can make your home more energy efficient and stop the wasting of unnecessary energy. So those are always things that I think we can do environmentally. Patty, we're gonna stick with you for this next question. St. Paul's safe tenant protections, which included just cause eviction protections and rules around security deposits and tenant screening were repealed in 2022. 
How would you work to sustainably reinstate tenant protections in St. Paul? Well, I'm familiar with those ordinances that were repealed, and I know the reason they were repealed was because a judge found them to be unconstitutional um, and in violation of the rights of the landlords. Um, but I think that we do have laws that protect against discrimination in housing, and I would hope that those can be enforced and that landlords are sensitive to not discriminate in those kinds of ways. Um, I, I think that's an important thing. I, I, I know there were lots of issues with forced and compelled speech for the landlords in, in general. Um, I don't think we should over micromanage the landlord-tenant relationship. There are some pretty bright lines there that the law already safeguards against and that landlords would be prosecuted for if they violated it. Troy? To be able to protect uh, landlords and uh, tenants is uh, often a difficult struggle, especially for those landlord or for those tenants who, who uh, don't have the means to make a security deposit uh, or are behind on their land or, or rent. Um, being able to create access uh, for people in those situations uh, is paramount, um, and. To this end, I would uh, look to investigate expansion in public housing options. Um, people need to have access to places to live, but landlords also need to have tenants uh, that can pay their rents. Um, and so I am cautious of some nuisance abatement policies uh, that seem to disproportionately affect low income and minority uh, tenants, um, but I do sympathize certainly with landlords. Isaac? So when I was in the ninth grade, um, uh, we were taken advantage of by a landlord and we ended up living in a roach infested hotel in which people were getting hepatitis and it was just a completely unsafe place to be. But when you pass something and it's deemed unconstitutional, you have extended something to someone who was in the situation that I was in, which would perhaps have been a lifeline, but then now it's pulled away because it didn't survive the court challenge, or it wouldn't have survived the court challenge. It's important that when we craft these things that we're diligent in how we do these things and that they're able to survive these sorts of challenges. We've also passed at the state level new tenant protections, and I think that absolutely has to be acknowledged, but then also most importantly, there's energy in this city to get rid of the exemptions to rent control, and one of the parts of those exemptions was just cause eviction. So again, we have to be very diligent about how we do these policies and understand that we can't make successful policy on Twitter. Sarah? Um, <clears throat> so when I joined the Mad Grove Community Council, we were also talking about safe tenant protections. This was in 2019. Um, again, I believe that everyone deserves to have access to safe and stable housing. Over 50% of our community members in St. Paul are renters. Over 40% in Ward 3 are renters. And the Safe Tenant Protections Ordinance provided um, guidelines around security deposits uh, so that people you know, weren't required to pay some ridiculous amount just to get access to housing and um, you know, prohibiting like, just cause evictions. And I think that you know, we really need to provide some type of stability for our renters. And I am looking forward to um, working with our community members to listen to them, uh, to working with our council members and our city attorney to be able to revisit tenant protection so we can bring back something that helps our renters so it's easier for them to find access to housing in our city. And I think that will also help us with our rent stabilization policy because I think that's a big reason why why the city, city com community members petitioned for it was because we did not get our safe tenant protections. Thank you. Sorry, we're gonna stick with you for this next question. Please describe a time when you had a compromise in order to solve a problem. So I, I can think of many things. You know, being an engineer, we compromise on our designs all the time uh, with architects that wanna you know, build really big dreams. But I think one thing I can think about um, is um, the McAllister Golden Community Council, you know, we looked over a series of policies that the city of St. Paul was considering, uh, one of them being, you know, tenant protections and uh, also being rent stabilization policy. And one that I do remember making some compromises on was when we looked at parking minimums. 
and we did end up um, voting as a council to reduce parking minimums because we could not agree to eliminate them altogether. And there was some further discussion that we really would have liked to had on that particular topic. Um, but at the time, we decided that the best thing to do was to move forward with something um, rather than getting exactly what we needed to be able to help um, with progress on that particular issue. So listening to each other um, and compromising in order to move things forward, I think, can be really important when coming up with policy. Isaac? So I mean, compromise is, is really the essence of small d democracy, right? But it's important that compromise can't be seen automatically as capitulation. So when I was working in the state senates, uh, we were working on getting workers' compensation benefits for firefighters, right? We believe that if a firefighter experiences PTSD, they should have the right to be to compensation while they're going to make sure that their mental health is stable. Who we find lined up against it was Minnesota cities, Minnesota counties, and the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. So what did this entail? It was a multi-year effort in which we had to have conversations, long, oftentimes laborious conversations, about trying to craft minute policy details, wordsmithing words in statute because legal words absolutely do matter. And honestly, it took some maneuvering. It took rallying our allies within the fire community, but ultimately what ended up passing was a massive compromise actually between Democrats and Republicans at a time that's not common. Patty? Well, if you work in the legal field and you sue people in businesses, you wind up doing a lot of compromises. 90% or more of the cases just really resolve via a settlement. It's always a compromise. Um, so that's been a large part of my life as an attorney is reaching a compromise with the other side. I would say that the compromises seem to be more easily reached when you've had a full um, chance to investigate and research the facts and when you're secure that you know what the law and the rules are that are going to be applied to that situation. So that's always a big part of it too. Yes, living in this world is really filled with a lot of compromises and you never get everything that you want. Nothing's ever really that perfect situation. But you will feel more secure with the compromise you make when you feel like you understand what it was all about and, and that you were fully advised of the facts. Troy? This semester at McAllister, I've assumed the leadership of position for a club called the Men of Color Collective. The Men of Color Collective was revitalized by a peer in front of mine named Victor Wright. Victor Wright and I have come from very different circumstances and have lived very different lives, but of course we have a common goal at McAllister to make and create a space where young men of color can be their best uh, and develop. The lines and direction by which we wanted to facilitate the Men of Color Collective varied staunchly. And I had to pull myself out of my privilege and recognize the ability for me to be flexible to ensure that the vision that Victor Wright had brought forth for the Men of Color Collective was realized. And while that isn't specific to policy as it pertains to this debate, I recognize that I can be flexible, be the glue guy for whatever policy comes on to the council. We're gonna ask the last question before we have closing statements. Troy, we're gonna stick with you. What groups will you rely on for input and advice both now and once you are elected? Certainly. Um, there are few nonprofits and PACs that uh, are certainly in tune to the issues uh, here in our ward and uh, in the city of St. Paul and the metro area as a whole. Uh, relying on their information, their independent research, uh, and their hands-on experience and expertise uh, to formulate my policy proposals is, is how I'm going to uh, approach any issue first and foremost. And then beyond that, I am of course going to uh, speak to a myriad of uh, constituents um, about how they not only feel about the issue, but how they might feel about a specific proposal. I may not be able to get to as many people as I would like to, uh, but I am committed to making sure uh, that people are heard and that I am well informed by the people and uh, political groups and nonprofits. Patty? I like to start with the people that are close to me and the people that actually live here. I've 
encountered and had the privilege of talking to a lot of people who had diverse backgrounds working in construction or whatever it is. And I usually find myself getting a lot of valuable information from somebody who has spent a lifetime or a decade or so doing something. And that information can prove invaluable. You also, you get leads from those people too as to organizations or other people who hold special expertise. So I like to go to the experts, but I never like to rely on just any one person or any one group because you never know what may be impacting some of those, those uh, sources of information. So I like to dig and look at um, as many points of view as I can find. Sarah? Yeah, so I believe you know, your city council member is your most local elected official and that they should be responsive and have an intimate understanding of your needs. And that is why you know, I have been making sure I'm reaching out to everyone in our community. We started knocking doors in January, and I personally, you know, in that phase, called over 1,000 people, and now I've knocked thousands of doors, so that I can reach out to the people in our community and be able to build those relationships and build that trust so I can bring that with me to City Hall. And so that's who I'm really gonna rely on, is all of those relationships with people that I've been building with this whole time. And then also I'm gonna you know, make sure I'm paying attention to groups that are underrepresented in our communities, such as our folks of color and our renters and students, and then rely on my endorsing partners um, and other partners that you know, haven't endorsed me. I have been supported by many climate action groups. Um, I'm the only candidate endorsed by LGBTQIA2S plus groups and our local elected leaders and our leaders in faith and many other organizations that I will rely upon to co-govern so we can make sure we're serving everyone in Ward 3. Isaac? So I think the important thing that we have to look at here is we have to make sure we engage everyone. So that includes the people who agree with us on issues, but it also includes the people that don't agree with us. It includes showing up to places in which you're going to get hard questions from people who may be upset with what it is that you've done or, or a position that you have. So who am I going to rely on? I think that the priorities of a council member who represents this area should be a reflection of the concerns of the residents of this area. So obviously it's going to be the people you talk to every single day, right? Again, even the people outside of your friend groups, moving beyond the people you know to try to find new folks. It's going to be working with people who have an expertise in certain areas. It's going to be working with people in the business community, union community, faith-based community, nonprofit community, our, our district councils, really trying to source everything and bring folks together on, on a place in which you can hopefully find a compromise and a way to move forward. We're now going to move to closing statements. As a reminder, each candidate will have two minutes. We're going to go in the opposite order of opening statements, which means, Troy, we are going to start with you. One, two, three, four good candidates before you. We have a ranked choice voting system. And so while I'm here before you advocating for your vote, I recognize that I have some very stiff competition and I respect that. If I'm not your first vote, let me be your second. If I'm not your second vote, let me be your third. And if I'm not your third vote, let me be your fourth, even though that doesn't ultimately help with the voting count. <laughs> and I'm serious about that. I, I, I seriously want you, even if I'm your fourth vote, to write my name in that fourth slot. Regardless of whether I'm fourth, third, second, or first, I want you to be intentional about your vote. I want you to care about who is going to be on the council. And it is my hope that I am not only on the council this January, but it's hope, my hope that I'm on the council for years to come and serving this city for as long as you will have me. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. I would like to say thank you to everybody that showed up tonight. Thank you to the League of Women Voters. I've come to appreciate that the local politics is really the most important. Unfortunately, it flies under the radar and we don't get a lot of people that will vote in these elections, so I really appreciate all the people that are tuned in. I really would like to work for this ward, for the city of St. Paul. I would like to take my life experience, the decades that I've spent investigating, researching, asking questions, and really trying to be thoughtful about any decisions that I made, and I'd like to put that to work for this city. And I would 
very much appreciate your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much to the League of Women Voters for putting this on and to all of you for being here and asking such thoughtful questions. Um, I'm running for city council because I love Ward 3 and St. Paul. I grew up here and I have seen the transformative change and opportunity that we can provide for our residents. It's why I've been choosing to show up in this community my entire life. It's why I chose to become a civil engineer and have been able to build up our community for the past 12 years. And it is why I am running for city council, to bring my community experience and my professional expertise to City Hall. Tonight we have talked about so many different issues and we are facing some of the toughest challenges we have ever seen, such as climate change and our aging infrastructure and making sure that we can provide housing for everyone. But I believe in us and I believe that we can provide the basic services and make visionary change. And that is what I bring to the table as an engineer, being able to look at the details and see the big picture, being able to see the design and being able to get it done. And I believe that we are most powerful together. There is not a challenge that we cannot face and a problem that we cannot solve when we come together as a community. I am ready to take the next step in the work that I've been doing my entire life right here in Ward 3 and hopefully serve you all on the city council. And with that, I bring hope tenacity, vision, expertise, and empathy for everyone in St. Paul so that we can build our big dreams. And I hope that we will be able to build a better St. Paul together and I would be honored to earn your vote. If you would like to join our community-driven movement, you can check us out at sarajost.com. Thank you. Thank you. Isaac. So this has been fantastic because I remember working for so many senators, trying to coordinate my senator to get there on time and making sure that I got the right information in the calendar, which I almost always did. But seriously, thank you so much for coming up because this is the essence of what democracy is, right? It's listening to what folks have to say, listening to what you have to say. You know, St. Paul, Ward 3 are fantastic areas. It's the reason why my family and I have set down roots here. It's a reason why we'll be raising our kids here. It's a reason why my father has been here. It's a reason why our family came to St. Paul in the late 60s. But St. Paul also does have a set of challenges that we must meet. We have issues with our housing stock. We have issues with economic development. We have issues with public safety. And we have substantive, formative questions on what the future of St. Paul is going to be. And to do that, we have to make significant policy decisions the type of policy decisions that will have ramifications for potentially generations to come. We have four new seats on the council, four open seats, which is an immense opportunity for new ideas to be on the council. But it's also the loss of a lot of experience. I've worked for nine years for Senate Democrats. I'm used to being in the meetings in which you work really hard and you come out and someone tells you, oh, that sucks, you know, <laughs> try again. Right? But that's the nature of the beast. That's how you do these things. And you understand that just because someone disagrees with you, they're not your enemy. Just because someone has a different opinion doesn't mean that they're the person that you should be hacking at in, a, in, in your groups of people that agree with you. We're focused on the basics and bringing a pragmatic voice, public safety, making sure we have good parks and libraries, working on our infrastructure, focusing on trying to make our property taxes manageable. Those are the sorts of things that folks all across the ward, the thousands and thousands and thousands of doors we've knocked are talking about. Those are the things that I want to focus on because from my background, that's what helped get me here. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank all of our candidates. Uh, as a reminder, early voting actually starts tomorrow, September 22nd, 2023. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be posting a full unedited, unedited recording of tonight's forum on the St. Paul Neighborhood Network YouTube page. On behalf of the League of Women Voters, we'd like to thank the Highland District Council, the Matt Groveland District Council, uh, our partner Sustain St. Paul, St. Paul Neighborhood Network, IATA Leeds, our candidates, and our audience. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you.